Welcome back to Brave Birds DFS, one of the best places for PGA, NFL, MLB, and NBA news, and of course, DFS. If you don't know by now, I'm Walt. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to my channel. Man, I am so close to 1,000 subscribers. Y'all better subscribe <laughs> to this video. I'm just kidding about the threat, but I am really close to 1,000 subscribers. Anyway, so when that rain started today and the thunderstorms, my first thought was not a Again, granted, there's no cut this week, so it wouldn't have been like early in the season. We were all scrambling, trying to figure out who was going to go in our round three lineups, but they got round two completed, so everything is all good. All right, let's pull up my checklist, and there's seven things that I like to look at. We're going to look at my top-level stats. I introduced these a few weeks ago. It's just some stats from round two that we can kind of kind of help us digest what the heck is going on. And then we're going to look at some strokes gain stats from the first two rounds to kind of see how people have been playing. The third thing we have to always remember and discuss is it is only one round. It is totally different when you make your showdown lineups versus making your four day classic lineup, a totally different process. Even though this tournament is kind of unique in that number one is somewhat of a birdie fest <laughs> and uh, you have a signature event. So you have a lot of studs. So there's there's less risk, but still it's only one round. So don't overthink who you're putting in your lineup. And then there's some game theory. This isn't straight up betting. You know, when you're on DraftKings Sportsbook or FanDuel or MGM or an actual old school casino, you know, you don't care if everybody in the casino wins because all of you all are going to get that payout. But there's a little game theory when it comes to DFS because in a guaranteed prize pool, they have that guaranteed prize pool. So the more people that win, the more people that chop with you, the worse it is for you. So just going straight up chalk number one doesn't win all the time and even if you do win with some straight up chalk you are going to be sharing your guap with a lot of people and then number five luck and gut and this really applies to this week i mean sometimes i mean i feel like i try to give you all the best content there's some other good content creators out there there are a lot of tools out there there's a lot of free stats paid stats there's so many things out there but at the end of the day sometimes it comes down to what you're feeling just what are you feeling what's 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 that luck what's that gut saying and especially in a tournament like this at a at a birdie fest with a bunch of uh, studs in a signature event I mean, in a way, you can't go wrong as opposed to certain events. You know, you I mean, U.S. Open last week, which was insane. You did some luck and gut. You might end up picking a player that goes 12 over par. Uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen at this tournament. And then I'm going to give you my DraftKings picks from all of the salary tiers. And then we'll discuss some round three studs. All right, so let's look at my top level stats. And uh, so we have first, we can look at round one that's on the left. So the range of scores for round one was five over par to eight under par. So a 13 stroke range, way different than the US Open. The high end is much higher. And like we said, we had some people that had 12, 13, 14 over par rounds. So another big difference. Um, round one, uh, players with, um, that shot five under five below par or better there were 12 players in round one and then round one the mode that's the score that showed up the most often was one under par the same thing for the median and then i have that player down here so i'm adding this new thing so i'm calling this player the uh almost doesn't count so uh, we have players from both rounds who just had a tough stretch of holes. And if it wasn't for that tough stretch of holes, they actually would have had a really good round. So the score that they ended up with wasn't as bad as it seems. So you had Siwoo Kim who had a tough stretch of holes in round one where he shot four over par and then the rest of the holes he shot, I believe five under par. So just had a tough stretch of holes. So we can go to round two. And once again, the range was exactly the same, five over par to eight under par. But round two was much easier than round one. 18 players, I mean, this is insane. 18, especially, you know, following up US Open. 18 players shot five under par or better we had the mode was tied you had an equal amount of players that shot two under par and three under par and then you had the median score was two over par so everything was easier and keegan bradley had he had a weird stretch it was kind of a long stretch from the third hole through i believe the 10th hole where he shot like four over par and the rest of the round he shot like seven under par so i just wanted to highlight those two players because they're players that 
you know, looking at their final score at the end of the round, it's like not that impressive, but they had a tough stretch, but the rest of the round, they did really well. All right, so let's look at the strokes gain data and strokes gain off the tee. Victor Hovland uh, leading in that category, followed by Asuke Batia, uh, 11 under par, playing really well. You have the lefty Brian Harmon at four under par, Taylor Moore, two under par, and Scotty Scheffler was the fifth best off the tee at 11 under par. So then we had strokes gain approach and Tom Hoagie, eight under par. Tony Finau been playing just playing better with every tournament, eight under par. Sun JM played nine under par, third best strokes gain approach. So uh, number four, you had Denny McCarthy. So that's scary. When Denny McCarthy is playing this well on approach, all we need him to do is to regress to the mean on putting. And you have someone that could shoot up the leaderboard. And then you have Austin Escrow in fifth place as far as uh, strokes gain approach at three under par. All right, so around the greens, we have old man Webb Simpson, uh, four under par. We have Ludwig Oberg, looks like Aberg at four under par. We have another lefty. It's a lefty extravaganza this week, Robert McIntyre at eight under par. You have Adam Svensson, uh, five under par. And you have Justin Thomas, blast from the past, nine under par, fifth in strokes gained around the green. And when it comes to putting, Patrick Rogers doing really well with the Stone Cold minimum today, seven under par you have ricky fowler have you checked out some of those outfits old outfits of his seven under par tom kim playing really well made my thumbnail i believe for the first time in probably this season 13 under par you have xander shoffley came into the tournament with the number one uh, recent form 10 under par colin morikawa was top five uh, recent form at 10 under par so looking at those strokes gain uh stats the two Stats that correlated most with being on the top of the leaderboard were putting and approach game. All right, so let's go over the DraftKings, and I'm going to give you my recommendations in all of the salary tiers. So we can start with 10,000 and above, and there are four players. And I got to be honest, let me be honest with you. <laughs> there's a pro, there's a con, but there's a pro to all these players. I really don't think you can do wrong with any of these players. But the player that I like the most is the player that's been the hottest, and it's going to be Xander. So I'm going to get the salary savings over Scotty with Xander. He's obviously came in with the number one recent form he's been putting and we'll talk about his round three prowess later all right so once again tony finau in my tournament overview video i just talked about how and you can look at it here i mean you can see he went from 52nd place to 18th place to 17th place to 8th place to third place so this guy has been trending in the right direction he's kept it up so far so i'm going with tony finau in the 9000s for round three tom kim i mean just doing well uh best tournament in a really long time 13 you know under par first place so definitely not going to try to get too cute and pivot away from tom kim and then denny mccarthy i talked about it i mean he's killing on approach as long as he can it continues to you know keep his approach at this level if he just starts putting i mean he's the number two putter putter in the PGA. If he just regresses back to being the number two putter in the PGA, then we have something really special at 7,600. And then we have the lefty McIntyre, who is either hot or cold. He obviously won the RBC Canadian, but was, had cut sandwiched around that. But he's hot now, and he's 6,700, and he's someone you, can sh you should consider for your lineups. All right, let's look at those round three studs. And looky here, we got the lefty again at the top of round three, Robert McIntyre. We have the Canadian Taylor Pendrith. We have Sam Burns. We have Wyndham Clark and Xander always popping up on every list, which makes sense because as I mentioned a bunch of times, he's number one in recent form. So let me know your thoughts. Feel free to leave any comments, but otherwise go out there and win that guap.